pray. Father, we come before your presence to hear from you, Lord. Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask for your presence here today. Take full control of every heart, every mind. Help, O oh God, as we open the word, dear Father, that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts. Take full control of this room. Remove every thought from our minds that is out in the world, dear Father, or cares, dear Father. Take it from us even now, so that, Lord, we'll be able to hear from you. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There have been many questions as to whether or not Jesus was made like us. Was he made a man? Was he actually a human being? The thought that he is God manifest in the flesh makes distance from our minds. How could he be like me? How could he be like a man but still yet be God? This idea holds in itself a mystery concerning the incarnation of Christ. Now you may ask, what, what is this word incarnation? What does that mean? So the word incarnate is defined as an assumption of human form or nature. That's an assumption of human form or nature. A living being embodied, embodying a deity or a spirit. So that's what incarnate means. So when it says that it, he came incarnate, it is meaning what he assumed when he came. The theological position in incarnation means a doctrine that the second person of the Godhead, which is Jesus Christ, assumed human form in the person of Jesus Christ and is completely both God and man. Now the question is though, Jesus was, was Jesus both God and man? In his incarnation, was he operating as God or was he operating as man? What was his role as Jesus? This leads us to another question in the title, Can Jesus Identify With Us? That's the title for our message today. Can Jesus Identify With Us? In this question, the question comes up, is this question salvific? Is there a relevance in this question to our salvation? Or perhaps we need not consider this question, as some suggest, as it does not impact our salvation. So I want us to look at this issue because it has been a debate in our church as Seventh-day Adventists as to the nature of Jesus Christ. It has been debated in other circles of churches outside of Adventist circle, evangelicals. They also look at this issue also as important. And you will see the importance of knowing whether or not Jesus just took a form looking like a body, looking like us, but really not, is not one of us. We will see whether or not this is important to our salvation. So I want to look at some passages of scripture. This describes how Jesus came. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Romans 8 verse 3 also says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now 2 Corinthians 5 21 also describes how he came in what form or condition he came, in what nature he came. It says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now all these texts make reference of our condition 
of being sinful. He came, it says in Romans 8, 3, because of the weakness of the flesh, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now many may say that he came looking like us. But it's really not of us. Some are saying this, and we are going to look into it as we investigate who and in what condition Jesus came when he came as one of us. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He was made unto us, made un he was made to be sin for us. And, and when you look at that expression, you're wondering what does that mean? Because the text continues to say, who knew no sin. In other words, he never committed sin when he came here, but he was made sin for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we see here that was something about how he was made that was pertaining to sin. Romans 8.3 highlights that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. So, I mean, if the Bible wants to describe just his form, could Paul not say he came in likeness of the form of flesh? But it says that he came in likeness of sinful flesh. Because Adam, when he was made, he was made sinless. But he was flesh, was he not? So, so, so here Paul is not highlighting a likeness to Adam as is in his form, but more a likeness to us that is closer to us than to Adam. Are you, are you listening to me? So now Luke chapter 1 also described the condition of Jesus when he came. Luke chapter 135 says, And the angel answered and said unto her, this is Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So no, we are seeing that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. But at the same time, we're seeing when he was born from Mary, he was being described as a holy thing. Amen? So we are seeing, wow, so, so he's in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was made sin for us who knew no sin. And we are seeing here that he was a holy thing. So, so, so we are trying to understand that. And from our limited understanding, based on how we see ourselves, was Jesus like us? That's the question here. First Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. This is again describing Jesus Christ. It is clear from these passage, passages of scriptures that Jesus was born a man. However, we will also notice that he was also God who came as man. And this means that he pre-existed. Now many are saying that Jesus only came when he was born as a man. And that's not true. If we look at the scripture and it talks about first uh, in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word created all things. There was nothing that was created that was not created by Him. And verse 14 of chapter 1 of the book of John says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who is that Word? Jesus Christ. So we see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Bible says, in the beginning, God created, right? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. So we know that it was Jesus who was in the beginning, who came incarnately as flesh through Mary. And so we know Jesus pre-existed. So in other words, he was, the God aspect of him was that he pre-existed as God, that he came as man. Not changing the fact that he never stopped being divine. The question is, in what condition of nature did he come or operate as man or 
Is it as God? Did he came to operate as God? Or did he come to be one of us? That's the question here. We know now, we know, we know man and his nature to be especially after Adam's fall. We understand the scripture to say that man was created in the image and likeness of God in Genesis 1.26. We also understand from scriptures that because of Adam's disobedience, all man was subjected to his fallen nature in birth. So we are struggling or grappling with the thought that Jesus is both God and man, but when he came in the, in the form of man, was he operating and dependent on the operation of his divinity? Or was he operating fully dependent on flesh? Meaning, He's operating as man, but depending on God. Now, Psalms 51, verse 5, describes us. So we want to compare now how we see ourselves to now make the connection here with how Christ came. Because we know that he was born of a woman. And this woman was like any woman that's in this room. She was not immaculate, as some suggest, meaning she was sinless and holy. That's not true, according to Scripture. Mary was a woman like any other woman, but selected by God, a follower, a believer in God, and she was chosen to be the vessel for the Son of God. Amen? So we are looking at now, what condition did Christ came? So we are seeking to understand the theme, can Jesus identify with us? So Psalms 51, the, the psalmist says, verse 5, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The NLT version of the same text says, For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Now that's all of us. And we're thinking to ourselves, was that Jesus also? Right? So we know that we, you know, many are ashamed or afraid to say a scribe, Jesus was a sinner. Because then if we say he was a sinner, then he needs a savior. But at the same time, we're saying he's one of us. Is that a contradiction? Is, are we contradicting ourselves? Because we said that he is one of us. But still, he was not a sinner. So now how do we distinguish the language? Now, sinner seems to always ascribe the actions of sin. The actions of sin, meaning a sinner does sin all the time, or the sinner does sin at some point or another in their life, right? So this is why when one says he's a sinner, they don't want to ascribe that to him because it seems as the action of sinning is also ascribed to him. So now, when we look at Psalms 51, fine, we, we can't seem to see Jesus in that category. But still yet he was born of a woman, though conceived by the Holy Spirit. So is he one of us or not? The question still is begging. Now let us continue to look at our condition, Romans 8, 7, because the carnal. Romans 8, 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that's our condition when we are born, right? We are born with a carnal mind, not having a, that, that, that influence or control by the Spirit, even though the Spirit does influence us when the mind develops and can be able to discern and run from right and so on. But we are born in that sinful state where we are shaped in the practice of sinning. Now, was that Jesus' state? Let's continue to study. This is the thought that now impacts how we see Jesus in his incarnation when he came as man. The thought that, you know, we were born a certain kind of way, and it seems as though Jesus could not be born like us. He, he, he could never be in, you know, in, in, in like us the way we were born. But let us investigate. Did he take a fallen human nature as indicated in Psalms 5, 51 verse 5, Romans 8, 7, or an unfallen human nature as indicated in Genesis 1, 26, meaning he was like Adam, without sin in terms of how Adam was created, had no sin impacted him, nothing sinful, no consequences of sin. Was that Jesus' state when he was born? Because Adam had no effects of liability of sin. No tired, no hungry, no thirst. Nothing affected Adam when he was created. So the question begs, 
was Jesus born in the same nature? We're still studying, right? So this is the essence of the, this question that brings out a lot of controversy and debate over this important question as to whether or not Jesus was born with a fallen nature or an unfallen nature. It, is also, it also impacts the question of our theme today, can Jesus identify with us or with me? If Jesus was born not, if Jesus was not born like me, how can he understand me to be able to help me go through what I'm going through if he does not identify with me? Is that a reasonable question? Or if Jesus was not born like me, how can he ask me to overcome as he overcame if he was not like me in Revelation 3.21? Is this another reasonable question? Now let us look at what the pen of inspiration says about the situation in uh, Bible commentary. Uh, 11, uh, the fifth, com uh, fifth edition of Bible Commentary, 1128, page 1128, paragraph 4. She says this, Do not set him, talking about Jesus, before the people as a man with the propensities of sin. That's our caution. He is the second Adam. The first Adam was created a pure, sinless being. Without a taint of sin upon him, he was in the image of God, he could fall, and he did fall through transgression. That's the first Adam. Because of his sin, his posterity was born with inherent propensities of disobedience. But Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God. He took upon himself human nature and was tempted in all points as human nature is tempted. He could have sinned, he could have fallen, but not for one moment was there in him an evil propensity. Now this is this is, this is good, uh, White's uh, description of Jesus as one of, right? So she's describing, you know, how Jesus was, right? But then she goes further to describe again, still yet talking about the same Jesus. So Jesus, Adam was this way, had no propensity, nothing in him, right? And he was created pure. But here she talks about, by, by, by cautioning us, don't give Jesus the same propensity. Don't, don't make him all man altogether that he has the same exact propensity as us. In other words, completely as we are, don't make him like that. But I'm going to explain what that means and what she's saying. She continued to say in Desire of Ages, page 117, she said, it would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. Now you might be saying what she just says, don't make him altogether man. Like us having all the propensities. But here she's saying it would have been almost an infinite and eternal humiliation for the Son of God to take Man's nature, talking about Adam, in his perfection, in his purity, before his fall, even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. So she said that it would have been an utter humiliation for the Son of God to come in Adam's nature before the fall. That's what she's saying here, right? But Jesus accepted humanity, she continued to say, when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly, uh, of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. So here she's highlighting that, oh yes, Jesus did take stuff from us or from Adam after the fall. Even though she was saying, don't make him altogether like us in our propensities, in all the way our minds drift off certain places and think certain things that we shouldn't be thinking. 
You know how we are like that? You know, we sit here for a moment and we are in the flesh here, but our minds are absent from the body in a sense. We're thinking all sorts of things. And when we're in places by ourselves, looking at things, watching things, listen, our minds are dwelling on things. She's saying, do not make Jesus' mind to be like that. But she's saying at the same time that Jesus never took from Adam his nature when he was in his innocence. But he took from us or Adam the fallen nature or the heredities of the fallen nature after 4,000 years. And she makes it clear that he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. So the great law of heredity doesn't only speak to our weakness and our offers and our suffering and our pain, but it speaks to other issues that comes with us. Is that right? She placed no limitation on this issue. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors, she said. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and our temptation and to give us an example of sin, of a, a, a need for a sinless life or how, what a sinless life could look like. So she already is showing that clearly Jesus did not accept the nature of Adam before the fall. She said, many claim that it was impossible for Christ to be overcome by temptation. Now, it would have been impossible if he, had a, if, if he was absolutely divine in his nature, then God can't sin. The Bible says we can't. God doesn't tempt man or we can't be tempted of God because God doesn't sin. He cannot sin. So if Jesus came in his pre-existing or pre-eminent nature of divinity, then he could not sin. Temptation would have no power over it, or it wouldn't even be temptation. That's what she's saying here. Right? So many are claiming that it's impossible for Christ to overcome by temptation. So if we take a position that he came in his divine nature, then the result is, yes, it is impossible for him to sin. But if he came as man, then there is reason to see how he can be tempted, like as we have been tempted. Amen? So she's saying that then he could not have been placed in Adam's position. He could not have gained the victory that Adam failed to gain. If we have any sense or a more trying conflict than, than had Christ, then would not, then he would not, then he would not be able to succor us. But our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. With the possibility of yielding to temptation. We have nothing to bear which he has not endured. So here in these statements, she has drawn Jesus' birth or coming closer to ours than before the fall. Are we seeing that? Clearly from these statements, there is a difference with how Jesus came from us, but also similarities with us. Sister White highlights that these factors, what does the scripture say about them? Let's look at what the Bible says now. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says, And so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So we see that the first one, God formed him from the dust of the earth, blew into his nostril the breath of life, and he became a soul. He became a soul because God created him soul. And every human being came out of Adam, even Eve. Isn't that right? Yes. Adam was put to sleep, and then God took two ribs from, from Adam, and he created Eve. And from there on, every human being was now born out of this couple. Are we seeing that? Yes. But we realize here that because they sinned, Adam and Eve, because they sinned, now the birth of every being was affected by that. So the first child never came out of the perf perfect, pure couple, but an imperfect couple. It came out of a fallen couple. So when the Bible says Jesus came by a woman, it is the same way all of us came by a woman. By the way, not by a man. So no matter what man says, you will never have man having kids. They may claim they change whatever they change, but they cannot change how God created them. Amen? So Jesus was born of a woman like every one of us was born of a woman. And so 
that is closely identifying at him with us in that regard. It says that clearly Jesus was born like us of a sinful woman, but his conception was different being of the Holy Spirit. Are we seeing now a difference? Right? So while we had a male and a female coming together to create another being, and that's how a child is being born, in Christ's situation, Mary conceived through the Holy Spirit. Right? So we are seeing a difference and we are accepting that there was a difference. It was Jesus who made this statement, John 3, 5 to 7 says, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So there was a necessity to be born of the Spirit to be where God is. And so Jesus himself came from God because he is God. And so how he was conceived was through the Spirit of God. So he was born of the Spirit. We were not born of the Spirit. He said that which is born of flesh is flesh. So we were born of flesh. Isn't that true? We were born of flesh. And so that makes us flesh. But he too was born of flesh, but also born of the Spirit. Amen? So it made him flesh, but influenced by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that's what distinguishes him from us. He was now under the influence constantly of the Holy Spirit. So, so Christ continues saying, that which is born of the flesh, what that which is born of the Spirit, is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. So in order for us now to be like him, because he is like us, we need to be born again. Amen? So that's the difference here. He was born of the Spirit, though in the flesh. Sinful flesh, the Bible describes it as. He came in the form of sinful flesh. So he was in our flesh, but controlled his mind by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 23, 24 says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So we see there is an issue with the spirit controlling our mind, right? So we see where once we yield to the spirit in control of our mind, once we have the spirit control our minds, then though we are still in flesh, we can condemn sin in sinful flesh. Are we together, beloved? So we are seeing exactly what Jesus came to do that we were not able to do based on some of our limitations. But that doesn't change the fact that he took whose flesh, whose nature? Our nature. Hebrews 5, 8, uh, Luke 22, verse, Luke 2, verse 40 and 52 says, And the child grew, talking about Jesus, and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This is Jesus. Can the same thing happen for us? Can we have that very same experience as this Christ? Because he was in the flesh. Right? And so we see that he grew up in the spirit and was filled with wisdom. Can we have the same experience? Yes. Absolutely. Hebrews 5, 8 says, Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So we see even Jesus in his childhood say was learning again obedience. Being obedient as he was influenced by the Spirit. John 5, 30 indicates that Jesus could not do anything apart from the influence of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, then he would have yielded to sin like us. We operate outside of the influence of the Holy Spirit. And this is why we constantly fall into sin and yield to temptation. But we see here Jesus was absolutely dependent on his Father. This is what he says. I can of my own self do nothing. In John 5.30, Jesus says, As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. That is how Jesus was able to stay in sinful flesh, but still stay connected and knew no sin. Are we seeing that, beloved? 
So he came into that sinful flesh after the fall, clearly not before the fall, and in that flesh he abide in the spirit and learned obedience according to the word, recognizing of his own self he could do nothing, but as he abided in the Father, he was able not to perform his own will, but the will of the Father that sent him. Amen? Amen. John 14, 10 and 12 says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The question he asked. The word that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth thee the works. Fear the really I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. So Jesus is saying, don't see that, okay, our birth, our, there's some difference with our birth, because I was conceived by the Holy Spirit and you were born of the flesh. I too was born of the flesh. Yes, the same sin, sinful flesh, but I came to give you something that you didn't have. But I was able to born of the flesh to recognize what the flesh does do. And I'm able to give it to you. Are you seeing that, beloved? But Jesus revealed that there is a birth that is influenced by the Holy Spirit. And he learned obedience to God. And that, and that is the birth he came by to give to all men. In this birth, Jesus highlighted, of himself he can do nothing. But as he abides in the Father, is given the ability to do the Father's will and not his own. Clearly, this is the difference with our birth and Christ's birth. Nevertheless, the question remains, was he born with a fallen nature? What does the scripture say in Hebrews 2, and this, this is the scripture text here, Hebrews 2, 14 to 18, and this is what the Bible says and describes about Jesus and how he came. Here Paul says this, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. This is not talking about eating flesh and blood. This is talking about how he came. Are we seeing that, beloved? It is saying here, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that that is the devil, and deliver them who, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to this bondage of death. For, for verily I took, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And Abraham is one of us, amen? So he didn't take the nature of angels. We know angel, angels don't feel pain, they don't suffer, they don't go through hunger and thirst. You know what I'm saying? But it says that he took the nature or the seed of Abraham. Now listen to what it says. And I want to share another version to show the clear, the clarity in the English here. It says that wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, be tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now I want to share with you the NLT version on this very same text, reading from Hebrews chapter 2, 14. This is what the word of God says. Because God's children are human beings, the text says, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. Praise the Lord. Are we seeing that, beloved? The Son of God also became flesh and blood. It says, for only as a human being could he die. Isn't that true? Can divinity die? So he could not come as divinity. All right? So divinity cannot die, so he did not come as divinity, though divinity was wrapped up with sinful flesh, mortality. It says that his operating nature was humanity and not divinity. Are we together? That the Son of Man also became flesh and blood. For only as human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son, of, Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us. 
his brothers and sisters, so that he could be a more or more merciful and faithful high priest before God, then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through the suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. You see, beloved, why I'm sharing this and I'm going in more to show you the importance of seeing this and its relevance to our salvation. Many are teaching that Jesus was sinless in nature. We know he committed no sin. That's not in, in debate here. But they are looking at his nature and saying he's sinless in nature. He could not have sinned. It makes him distant from us. Because as I go through my tribulation, as I go through my struggle with sin, as I go through these things, can I call upon Jesus to understand what I'm going through? If he's not like me, in no way, shape, or form, then that's the Jesus they are presenting. But the word of God presents differently, beloved. The word of God says he came and was made as flesh. He was made sin. How could he be made sin? Many are claiming that, oh, when he go on the cross, that's how he, he was made sin. How can he go made sin? Oh, 31 years that he has lived, or 33 years that he has lived, no sin. Then on the cross, all of a sudden, sin, he just was made sin. Does that, is that logical, beloved? It has to be from his incarnation when he came under, or from a woman, being born of flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. While he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in his mind, Guided by his Holy Spirit, being born of the Holy Spirit, at the same time being born of the flesh. Of the flesh, the Scripture here revealed that he did not take the nature of angels, but because he did not come to help angels, but he took the seed of Abraham, who he did come to help. Therefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, especially for the suffering of death, which was the ultimate reason in which he came for man. He came to die in our place. He came to die in our stead. In behalf of us. In other words, we should have died. Adam's sin condemnation came upon Adam and his entire race. We all participated by our own choices in sin. Yeah. So our portion, our suffering is condemnation. We deserve that. The wages of sin is that, the Bible says. But Jesus did not allow this issue of, of sin to, to, to affect us immediately. When Adam sinned, he lived, the Bible says. Even though in the day that you sin thereof, you shall surely die. But he lived. Many may argue that he didn't live to a thousand years. That might be true. Because a thousand day to the Lord is like a thousand years, right? And so in the day that you eat of this, you shall. So in a sense, he did die in God's understanding of what a day is, right? But, but he did not, the truth of the matter is that he did not die immediately. Because if he had died immediately, then he would have been obliterated, annihilated from God altogether. But he lived and was able to give a second opportunity to choose again. Amen? He made his choice. His portion was death. Still yet, grace stepped in. Jesus had a plan before the world began. So that when Adam sinned, there was already prepared a savior. Amen. So death was averted, beloved. The condemnation was removed. And Adam was placed under grace, benefiting from this very temporal life. All of us was born in, because Jesus is the light that lighted every man that comes into the world. We are all benefactor of the grace that was given to Adam. Amen. We were born into that grace. In other words, we were born forgiven. God showed us his mercy. The same mercy that was given to Adam was given to every last one of us. We were born into a gift. This very life that we are having and experiencing, it came at a cost of Jesus giving his life. Every year that we breathe to our nostrils was stamped the cross of Calvary. Every loaf that we put to our mouths will also stamp the cross of Calvary. Or living, or moving, or existing is because of Jesus Christ. Yes. So the same benefit that went to Adam also came to us. Yes. Are we seeing that? That's the reason he came. But he had for him to come in that form. He had to take something from us. 
See, God law has to be judged as well. See, God can't take a payment from somebody who doesn't deserve to give a payment. If you have not sinned and you were born in a condition with no sin, how can you come now to the Lord and matter payment? The Bible says sin is the transgression of God's law. And the wages of sin is? But Jesus committed no sin. So how can God law now make a demand of a payment? Think about it. The Bible says the just for the unjust. Right? Jesus was just. He did no wrong. Still yet, he was dying for the unjust. How could that be? If we are saying that he's sinless, he had nothing pertaining to sin in his body, just took a form, and, and that was it, and the form was still able to suffer pain, go through thirst and hunger. The arts are pain. Hunger and thirst are a consequence of sin. Is, it, uh, do we know angels having pain? And do we know angels hungering and thirsting? No. These conditions that we go through are consequences of sin. So Jesus, for him to be a perfect substitute, he had to take something from us. And that's why he took sinful flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came in our nature so he could be our perfect representative. While he committed no sin, the Bible makes clear, but the Bible also, he said, he was made sin unto us. And so in order for him to do that, he had to take our sinful nature. Are you listening to me? Now, A.T. Jones has some insights on how he saw the nature of Christ. This is what he says in a consecrated way, page 18. He said, the first chapter of Hebrews revealed that Christ's likeness to God is not simply in form or representation, but also in very substance. And the second chapter is clearly reveals that his likeness to men is not simply in form or in representation, but also in very substance. It is likeness to men as they are in all things, exactly as they are. What he's saying here is that in chapter one of the book of Ehu, God was, Christ was likened unto the Father. But not just in form, but in substance. The same thing with chapter two. Chapter two now describes Jesus as man, but not in likeness or form, but in the very substance. Amen? This is what he's saying. And so, wherefore it is written, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. John 1, 1 to 14, it says, and what this is, this likeness to man, as he is, in his fallen sinful nature, and not as he was in his original sinless nature, is made certain by the Word. That's what John says. He says this, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the sufferings of death. Therefore, as man is, since, the, since he became subject to death, this, will, was, this is what we see Jesus to be in his place as man. Therefore, just as certainly as we see Jesus, lower than the angels unto the suffering of death, so certainly it is by this demonstrated that as man, Jesus took the nature of man as he is since death entered and not the nature of man as he was before he became subject to death. In other words, when before Adam sinned, A.T. Jones is saying Jesus did not take the nature of Adam before death entered. Because only when Adam sinned, death entered. Jesus did not take Adam's nature before death entered. He took the nature of Adam when death entered. That's after the fall. Amen? And that's why he's able now to be now able to take that debt in our behalf. Amen? Amen? He continued to say that clearly Jones is supporting the scripture by highlighting the important fact that and the fact that fact and evidence that as Christ is his likeness in very substance to God and not just form, in the first in the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, so he is likeness to man. In the very substance, not just from, not just in form to man in the second chapter, but of the same substance in the second chapter. Jones pointed out why he specified fallen nature and not unfallen nature by indicating that Christ took the fallen nature of man as as man was since death was entered, and not in the nature of man as he was before he became subject to death. He aligns with Scripture in what nature Jesus was born and why. 
He makes resoundingly clear a very crucial and biblical position, highlighting the fact that Adam before the fall had nothing in his nature pertaining to sin or its consequences. Though he willingly chose to sin, this was without any effects in his nature or liabilities of sin. On the contrary, this was not the case with Jesus. While Jesus was conceived through the Holy Spirit and had the influence of the Spirit being born of the Spirit, he had every liability of consequence of sin in his nature. Because Jesus took Adam's or man's nature not before but after Adam fell. While his mind was under the influence of the Spirit according to what the Scripture means by being born of the Spirit, it is clear that he had in his nature the laws of heredity that we were born with. This the scripture reveals by saying it behooves him to be made like unto his brethren. In other words, it was necessary for Jesus to made, be made like us in every respect so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. In other words, how could he understand as a mediator before God and man what I am going through? How could he say, I understand what she's going through? right now. The addiction, the inherited tendency, the, the cultivated these things that are affecting her. I understand. This was the position held by the church, that Christ took a fallen nature right up to the 1950s. However, the church has been divided on this point ever since 1957, Questions and Doctrines. We now say we now say Christ had taken a nature of man before Adam's fall. That's what we hold as a church. Some say it is okay to say that he took both natures, pre and post fall, leading to much confusion. Because then we wouldn't like, okay, he was pre fall, post. What, what what was he? A hybrid Jesus. He still does not. Because the important thing is, does he identify with us? Now the author of the book, Evangelical Earthquake, Vance Pennell, wrote in his book on page 16 to 18 of his book that, that which was written in the book, Bible Reading of the Church. In other words, he was writing about a book that existed by the church before on Bible readings. The, ch the chapter was A Sinless Life, or The Sinless Life, in 1915 edition of Bible Readings. It says that, in his humanity, Christ partook of our sinful fallen nature. If not, then he was not made like unto his brethren, was not in all points tempted like as we are, did not overcome as we have to overcome, and is not therefore the complete and perfect savior man needs and must have to be saved. The idea that Christ was born of an immaculate or sinless mother, inherited no tendencies to sin, and for this reason did not sin, removed from him from the realm of a fallen world and from the very place where help is needed, on his you and I, Christ inherited just what every child of Adam inherits, a sinful nature. On the divine side, all this was done to place mankind on vantage ground and to demonstrate that in the same way, everyone who is born of the Spirit may gain like victories over sin in his own sinful flesh. Thus, one is to overcome as Christ overcame. Without this birth, there can be no victory over sin. The Bible says the same thing. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. Also, Hebrews 14 that we already read shows the essential essentiality, shows essentially that Christ took not the nature of angels. Now the prophet Isaiah says the same thing. The prophet Isaiah declared in Isaiah 53, 1 to 7, who hath believed or report? And to whom is the harm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root of a dry ground, and he had no form nor comeliness. And when he shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet we did he esteem him stricken, spin of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his tribes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone unto his own way, and the Lord had laid upon him the iniquity 
of us all. Isaiah is asking us today, even as he was in, uh, in his day, who shall believe my report? Who shall believe my report? Do you believe that Jesus does not identify with you? Do you believe Jesus is some distant being from heaven who came and he could not have done the things that we have done and so this life did not affect him even though he had some sort of flesh. Yes, we saw blood coming from him. Yes, it looked like he was in pain. But do we believe that he took our grief? Do we believe that he took our sorrows? He experienced pain, not for himself, but on our behalf. And for him to go through that experience, it simply means that he took our natures. Paul giving us the assurance in Hebrews 2 9, he said, What do we see? What do we, what, what, what we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position, a little lower than the angels, and because he suffered death for us. He is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, but yet without sin. In other words, he has the feeling of our infirmity. Who can best identify with somebody but the person who has been in that shoes? Who had gone the same or similar experience? Who could say from experience, I know, I understand what it is that you are going through. Who can be best able to describe, empathize with such a one in their sufferings? How dare we rob Jesus of what he experienced? He identify with us to the point that he was willing to not exist if that was what it took. Sequence. In closing, beloved, the question was asked in the beginning can Jesus identify with us? Through his sacrifice, this is what the pen of inspiration wrote while he hung upon the cross, while he knew the mission in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was going through this struggle. And as he went through that struggle, this is what the pen of inspiration says. The Savior could not see through the portals of the pen. Hope did not present to him as coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or telling him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish as a sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Jesus could not see through the portals of the grave. In other words, he wasn't sure that he would come back after taking our sin. I just wanted to bring that word 
to you today to reassure you of where you are and what you're going through. God understands and identifies with us.